we're in John chapter 4 tonight, and um, pardon my voice, I'm kind of getting over some stuff and probably talking too much lately, and so I'm a little raspy, but uh, uh, just bear with me. All of us at one point or another have crossed over a bridge, right? We've all driven over a bridge, and, and we never think about a bridge going out from underneath us than when calamity happens. And so just a few weeks ago in Baltimore, you know, that cargo ship is sailing through the harbor or steaming through the harbor and runs into a bridge, and sure enough, it collapses. And, and a few years before that, there was a bridge that just collapsed in Oklahoma. There's been some that have collapsed in Minneapolis. And I remember the one that collapsed in Oklahoma um, because it was right around the time of our first visit to California, San Francisco to be exact. And I never really thought about traveling over a bridge. I've always trusted a bridge, right? We don't think about it. Like, we just keep driving like life is good. We don't worry about it. We don't think about when you travel over something like the Golden Gate Bridge that was designed in 1917, when cars were not nearly as heavy, did the engineer sit down and go, you know, in 100 years from now, there will be 110,000 cars that drive over this bridge, so I need to make sure I engineer it right. We never think about that until calamity happens, right? We don't think about the 600,000 rivets in each tower of the Golden Gate Bridge, and we never think, what if somebody came to work on a wrong day, had a bad day, and did a rivet wrong in one of those towers? We don't think about the, I think somewhere around, what is it, 80,000 miles of cable? laid in the Golden Gate Bridge, and what if it ruptures? We don't think about any of those things, let alone that the thing weighs 894,000 tons suspended over the ocean. We just drive over it like we have no worries. I mean, Think about all the earthquakes in the Bay Area over the last hundred years. Certainly one of them might have shifted some of the ground in the ocean that is holding that foundation that when that bridge just moves the right way, the whole thing comes crashing to the ground. We never think about it. We never think about it. Doubt never creeps in when bad things don't happen to us. We tend to live in this blissful, idiotic existence that nothing bad will ever happen when we drive across a bridge that was designed a hundred years ago. But we could take anything, really. We trust electricity until one day we're fiddling with the switch and it shocks us. And therefore, we don't want to touch electricity ever again. We love our animals, we love our dogs, and we'll pet our dog until it bites us, and then we're like, no more. We had a gerbil growing up. I hate gerbils. I absolutely hate them. His name was Webster, based off the little TV show Webster. Remember what, how many remember, old enough to remember Webster? Some of you are way too young. And we had this hamster, and gerbil, I'm sorry. And please don't think ill of my family. We were country bumpkins. This was Texas. This was not California. So do not call PETA when I tell you this example. But this gerbil liked human flesh. That's all I could say. He loved to bite. So when you would go and sprinkle in food, he would nip at you like the giant devilish rodent he was as you dropped the food in. And one day... He picked the fight with the wrong fella. Harold Dean Kennedy, my father, the patriarch of our family, goes in to feed that hamster, and it bit him. Now, you trust your animals until they bite you, right? Well, Dean Kennedy looks at him and goes, all right, you want to play that? So this is terrible. This is terrible. He has repented. He is still going to heaven. Do not send me letters. This was 30 years plus maybe 40 years ago. I used to get allergy shots as a kid that when you could take allergy shots at home. So dad goes in the cabinet, finds a syringe, goes out to his building. This is when you could buy Freon over the counter. 
<laughs> I can't believe I'm telling this story. It's terrible. Dad fills that syringe up with Freon. Listen, he's repented. It's okay. People have murdered and gotten off and living in society since this has happened. So it's okay. So he goes in and he sprinkles in food, puts his hand down as a bait. Like, here, gerbil, 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 gerbil. That gerbil bites him again on the finger, and when he does, he sticks that gerbil in with the syringe. That sucker runs around the cage twice, and my dad says all of a sudden he just goes. <laughs> <laughs> so we trust our animals until we don't. Now, some of you are like, that is the worst thing possible. It is, but you would do something similar if an animal kept biting you. I cannot believe I told that story. I'm never going to point out who my dad is. Some of you think Pastor Mark's my dad, so that's a little confusing too. But we trust things until we don't. We have to trust the inventors, the engineers, our animals, the designers. If we don't, we become crippled. When things go wrong, it causes doubt and unbelief, and inevitably, unbelief creeps into our lives at the most inopportune time, and if we let it, it will absolutely bury us. Sickness and death of a loved one makes one, us wonder about the purpose of life. A lost job makes us skeptical of the plan of God for us. Unbelief creeps in and begins to throw us off our games if we're not careful. And this happens to the best of people because we're not given the privilege of seeing Jesus heal blind eyes or make the lame walk. So we solely have to trust the testimony that is found in the Bible. Now, this shouldn't ter terrify us at all. Matter of fact, I would say this, if you believe in anything, it takes belief. I mean, some of you today sat down at a restaurant and somebody served you food and you had to trust that the food that they served you was cooked to the right temperature and that they didn't spit in it, right? It takes belief. When you turn on your faucet and you put a glass of water underneath it, you are putting an awful amount of trust in pipes that can be 20 to 30 to 40 for some 50 years old. Everything takes faith. Everything. I've had people tell me before, you know, I would believe in God if he would just reveal himself. And my response is, he has, and he wrote a best-selling book about it. So whether you are a skeptic or whether you're a person of faith, at the end of the day, you have to put your faith in something. As we looked up at the sky this week, I don't know if you wore those stupid 3D cardboard glasses. I did for a brief moment, and I looked up, and I saw the eclipse go by, and then I, I watched all the responses on the news, and people are, like, talking about all kinds of wonderful things. This is a wonderful moment. This is glorious. And, and how can you look at the things in the universe and not go, I have to put faith that that just happened out of accident, or I have to have faith that God ordained the universe. All of us have a belief system. Roger Olson would say that all of us are theologians because we all have beliefs and thoughts and ideas about God. And if you have no beliefs about God, that is a belief system in and of itself. So John's point in writing his gospel is that you may believe. Remember John chapter 20, we talked about this last week. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He says in his letter, look at this. This is John's letter to a church. Look at how he starts it. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, 
which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and we have heard and we have proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Belief and trust in his testimony is John's paramount focus. He wants you to believe. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for belief, pistuo, uh, which we see in the Greek, uh, appears a hundred times in the Gospel of John. A hundred times. And most of the time, when it's referring to pastuo in the Gospel of John, it means a salvific belief, meaning it is a belief unto salvation. This is John's whole point. And the reason belief is so important to John, it spells it out in his gospel. By believing in Jesus, we become the children of God. Look what he says. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now think about that statement for a moment. I love my kids. I like yours. I'm going to give stuff to my kids that I will not give to yours. I'm going to be there no matter what. I'm going to defend them to the death. Yours, maybe, on a good day. And that's not, that, it sounds funny, but it's true. Like, we have raise Clara and Ellie. They are ours. They are a part of us. They share our DNA. They talk like us. They walk like us. They look like us. They are every bit ours. Yours, I like. They're decent. They're one, I mean, I have kids over at our house all the time. I love, I love my kids. I like yours. Some of yours I just tolerate, but most of them I like. So what is John saying here? When you believe, you become family. That is such an important, impactful statement. You know how I know God is not going to abandon you? Because you're family. You know how I know that God is going to provide for you? Because you're family. You know why I know God has his best for you, even though sometimes we don't always see it? Family, right? My kids don't like going to school every day, but I know it's for their good. So as a bad parent, I can go, I just stay at home. I'm gonna give you whatever you want to make you happy in the moment. That is not love. Matter of fact, write this down. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. It's not caring, right? So when God disciplines us, when God corrects us, when God wants to put us on a true and straight path, that is not punishment. That is God knowing what is best for us because he loves us. So when people go, why can't God just allow me to do whatever I want? Because it's unloving of him. Do you get that? Everybody who's a parent should get that. I don't let my kids eat cotton candy every night for dinner because I'm mean. It's because I love them. Right? You follow me? Okay. That's the sidebar. By believing, the reason John says we believe is we become children of God. And by believing, we receive eternal life. Now listen to me. This is important. And this may rock a lot of your theology here. When we die, our goal is not spiritual bliss floating on a cloud in heaven. Our goal is resurrection. We have a new life. We have a life that is imperishable and incorruptible in a new heavens and a new earth. It is a physical dwelling place. 
So when God says we have eternal life, take everything good in this life and multiply it by infinity, and that's what it is. Everything good, nothing bad, nothing bad. I envision in the afterlife, we don't wake up and stub our toes. I envision in the afterlife, I'm six foot three. Can dunk a basketball and run like a gazelle. This is what I envision. Oftentimes when we we just pass by these passages because we've seen them over and over and over again and we go, oh, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we think of floating on a cloud with a harp and that sounds boring to me. And so heaven doesn't seem real because we have a false picture of heaven. Heaven is resurrection. New heaven, new earth, new body ruling and reigning with Christ and being eternally in relationship with him. So John says it's paramount. Belief is huge. And I think doubt creeps in most of the time because it's the enemy's most powerful weapon. It easily can knock you off course. Look what the Hebrew writer says. Take care, brothers, lest there be any evil it, lest, it, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away. So John makes it important uh, or focuses on belief in his book. And you'll hear me say this over and over and over again. At the end of this seven-week series, you'll go, Oh, enough. I get it. John wants us to believe because he put these signs in place so that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. Oh, and I'll go, yes, you finally got it. (laughs) See, John's addressing four types of unbelief. Let me show you these. There are four types of unbelief. There was unbelief due to lack of exposure. There were people who had never been exposed to Jesus. So what happens post-resurrection And this applies to us today. Those who have unbelief due to lack of exposure have to have what in their life? Exposure. How do they get exposure? By you opening your mouth and preaching and proclaiming so that others can believe. The second second phase of unbelief was due to a, a lack of information. The unbelief was due to information. They didn't have the right information about Jesus. So I'm sure there were people in Jerusalem and Galilee, as the Bible kind of indicates, that believed he was, a, he was a prophet, he was a teacher, he was a faith healer, whatever it was. And so again, the way to resolve this is by proper teaching and understanding and explaining and discipleship and preaching. The third, the third was this. There was unbelief due to a perceived lack of evidence. This is true today. I just don't think Jesus is God. But I think Jesus is a great guru to learn from. No, he's a lunatic if he's not God. Because he equated himself to being God. And so what the Jewish people were wanting is they had a very specific idea of what Messiah would look like. They believed that Messiah would be this conquering warrior who would come in and look at the Romans and go, you got 30 days to get out of this town, kind of like those old Westerns. And if I, when I come back in 30 days, Romans, if you're not in, in, out of this town, I'm going to drive you out. So when Jesus starts going after religious leaders, everybody's like, well, that's not Messiah. The Messiah is supposed to be John Wayne. Like, he's supposed to be this tough guy, and yet he's talking about peace and kindness and meekness, and yet he's yelling at our religious leaders. They had a perceived lack of evidence of what the Messiah was supposed to be. And fourthly, was there was an unbelief due to self-righteousness, stubbornness. And I can tell you that this happens today in modern churches. 
I pastored people in modern churches for the last 20 years, and I can go, this is what the Bible says, and they go, I don't believe you because it doesn't jive with my emotions. Okay, but let's, let's go to the text. The text says, somebody came up to me right before service and said, somebody argued with me and said that we are not supposed to share in the sufferings of Christ. And I go, they haven't read the Bible, right? We have this idea of what religiosity should be. And we become set in it and stubborn with it and set in our ways. And we, we equate method oftentimes with message. So the way I pray for you may offend you because it's not the way your daddy's pastor prayed for you. We become self-righteous and hold on to tradition. And Jesus would address this time and time again. If you read the book of Mark, he talks about why are you holding on to the traditions of men? The new has come. The Messiah is here. And yet you are so stubborn that you want these people to obey these traditions and they have nothing to do with me. So John, when he's writing his gospel, is really trying to combat one through three. He's wanting to give evidence to people to be exposed to the gospel, to give them more information of Jesus and to provide them evidence. And especially in the story we're about to read, we're gonna see this evidence is Jesus. It's not even the signs. Jesus is the sign. And that's the point of John chapter four. Let's look at it. Here we go. John chapter four, verse 43 after two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that they had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made water, uh, water wine. And at Capernaum, there was a, an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. So Jesus uh, said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left and the father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he believed and his household. And this was the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee. Now, before we get into the story, let me give you a little bit of context. Jesus, in this story, is coming out of a region called Samaria. And what you have to understand about Samaria is it was a dump. It was a dump of a dump, and they had their own temple, which was abhorrent to the Jews. And in the Jewish eyes, the Samaritans were garbage people. So remember that, remember when I've, I've told you Acts 1.8, when Jesus says you'll go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, what he's doing with Jerusalem is he's saying, you're going to go to a place where you're hated. And then he says, you're going to go into Samaria, which is a place where they hated others. The Jews and Samaria, Samaritans did not get along at all. And for good reason, just years earlier, Samaritans desecrated the temple by the Jewish temple by scattering human bones on its doorstep. So tensions are incredibly high and they were not wanting to have anything to do with the Samaritans. But Jesus wanders through Samaria and speaks to a woman and a large group come to believe. They accept Jesus. Look what John says about it here. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She said, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. 
That's an important statement coming into John chapter 4. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So immediately after this moment, Jesus comes back to his home in Galilee and John tells us this foreshadowing, this foreboding thing that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. In other words, it's gonna be easier for outsiders to believe than insiders. And this is true to this day. Then he makes his way back to Galilee and this is where our story picks up. And John says what happens next is a royal official comes and approaches Jesus. Now, what I find interesting about the two signs is, is that Jesus is both involved in our celebration and our sickness. John's first two signs, he's involved in our celebration and our sickness. And it's almost like bookends. It's almost as if John is saying, God is there in the good times and the bad times and everything in between. It's quite remarkable how he reacts to this. God just doesn't care about our eternal. He cares about our immediate and temporal needs, both our happiness and our heartbreak. Now, there's really two important details that I need to point out before we get too far in the story. First of all, Capernaum is where the royal official lived, and Cana is eight hours away by foot from Capernaum. More than likely, the royal official would have traveled on horseback or chariot, which would have taken him two hours. And because he was an aristocrat, he was probably traveling by caravan. And because he was an aristocrat, it probably means he was a Sadducee. Now, this is a stupid Sunday school trick. But do you know why he was a Sadducee? Because he was sad, you see. This will help you remember. It's not a dad joke. It'll help you remember. Sadducees were very deterministic. They believed in fate. Whatever was going to happen was happen, would happen. They They didn't believe that there was a resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. They didn't believe that God would intervene into human affairs. That's why they were sad, you see. They, they believed that whatever happened in your life was determined and you could do nothing about it. Your status, your job, your money, your sickness, your death, it was all predetermined and there was nothing you could do to push back on that. Now, being in a reformed community, largely, you have probably run across people who think that everything is just predetermined. But we, as the people of God, who are filled with the Spirit, believes that God still intervenes into the affairs of human beings. We still believe in healing. We still believe in miracles. We still believe that the Spirit moves. But a Sadducee would just simply be more intellectual. A Pharisee, conversely, would be a religious leader, and they were often judged, they were often viewed as people who kept the law meticulously. They believed that God was involved in the details of life, and they believed in the most part in the resurrection, but this was not a Pharisee. This was a Sadducee. Now think about the scene and think about the irony. A man who did not believe that God intervened into human affairs, into the world approaches the incarnation to ask for him to intervene in his life. It's probably not lost on anybody that this man who is deterministic is on his knees, which is how the Greek renders it out, begging God to do something for his son. Isn't it interesting that all of our intellect and all of our pride and all of our certainty oftentimes gets pushed to the periphery when someone we love is suffering? All of it goes out the window. And on this day, he's a father who's scared to death that his son is going to die, and he's hoping against hope that this poor, itinerant preacher can do something about it. Forget the dignity forget his position in society, 
forget his theology, forget his worldview. His son is dying, and some of you have been there. Some of your very first prayers in the faith were prayers of desperation. God, I need you to do something. What Jesus says next seems to be a little insensitive, but it's only because of the English translation. Jesus says something where he really is not addressing the nobleman, rather he's addressing the entire crowd. He says this, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And unless you actually see something that I do that's magical, you won't believe it. And if it sounds like an indictment, it is. Remember, John just gets done telling, that, telling us that Jesus was in Samaria where many people believed in him simply because of his word. He comes to the Jewish people in a Jewish town, worshiping in a proper Jewish way, who believe in a coming Jewish Messiah, and they will not believe unless they have a sign. It's a condemnation. He's rebuking them right there in the moment. And he rebuked them again in John chapter 6. I did the daily Devo today, and we'll talk about it uh, sometime later. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now, as a soundbite, we go, oh, that's so great. I am the bread of life. But what Jesus is doing when he's saying that is he has a crowd around him. He is feeding thousands of people and they want fed again. And he goes, you don't understand what is in front of you. I'm not just here to meet your temporal need. I'm here to do something for your soul. If you just cling into me, you will be satisfied forever. This is Jesus's point here. When he says, you're just looking for a sign, and it's almost as if they can't see the forest because of the trees. They see only what Jesus has to offer, but they don't see him. How many people, and not on a Wednesday night, but how many people on a Sunday morning walk through our doors that miss the forest through the trees and they just want the goosebumps, they just want the holy moment, they just want God to do something for them and God out of his mercy and grace and love and compassion and goodness for his people does it, but they walk out missing the point. The point isn't the signs and the wonders and the miracles. The point is him. So many people miss that. We, we get so busy and worked up trying to feel without believing. And so Jesus does what Jesus does. He heals the boy without props. This is something nobody has ever done. Remember, we're in a magical, miraculous world where there are miracle workers. And I said that last week in a little soundbite, and I had tons of people coming up to me going, wait a second. You mean to tell me that there were a bunch of miracles going on that Jesus wasn't a part of in the Galilee? Yes. Yes. But Jesus does it in a unique way. Never in recorded history do we see Jesus, other people, by a word healing somebody. So you could probably say some of those miracle workers, when they laid hands upon you, it might have created a placebo effect. Maybe they were crafty uh, with medicine, whatever it was. But Jesus just goes, hey, you know what? Your son's going to be healed. Just like in Cana, remember in Cana, he didn't do some, you know, nothing like that. He just said, take that out, take it to the head waiter, have him taste it. And so he does the same in this sign. He goes, your son's healed. Now, can you, can you imagine that? Like, seriously, put yourself in that dad's position. Jesus, ah, man, my son's dying. You people all want a sign. All of you, your son's fine. But you won't believe unless you see a son. I, you didn't hear me. He's good. Go on home. We're good. 
The guy's probably sitting there going, that's it? I traveled two hours for that? So he gets on his donkey or horse or whatever, and as he's going back, his servants are meeting him, and they're putting dots together that this person that I just came in contact with, that I had an idea that he may be a faith healer or a miracle worker, just said it with a word, and at the exact moment, the exact hour, the child is healed. It's an amazing story. But what are we supposed to do with it? How are we supposed to handle this? What do we do with this sign? Well, like the noble one, the world demands a sign before it's willing to believe God. People want God to do something for them before they believe. Our world is enamored with pragmatism or what works for them. I, you may not know this, but I write sermons for other churches. And it, it oh, I, I hope he doesn't see this or they see this. But they, they call me and they go, that's a great message, but I need more application. I need more application. I need something that people can take home and do. Hear me. There are times where application is radically important and there's times that the application is think on this, worship towards this, pray towards this, ponder this. But as Westerners, we just want a checklist of if I can just do one, two, and three and go home and get it done and not have to think about it again, then everything is good. They want a sign. They want something to do. They want something that they can physically see. But the gospel, it's not something that you do. It's something that you believe. To your dying breath, you believe it. You hold on to it. You think about it. You wonder about the glory of God. It is about belief, not doing and the reason we creep into works time and time again is because we're pragmatists. And okay, I just need to earn my spirituality today. I need to, I need to read my Bible, read the app. Do I hit the talk it over button or not? Nah, I don't want to bother with that. Next page. Okay, uh, let's see. 10 minutes, I'm going to pray. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe that works. Uh, uh, oh, I, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. I've checked it off every box. I'm good. And what God wants you to know is you will never be good. You will always need the gospel. You will always have to believe in him time and time and time and time and time and time again. And as that is working through you, all of a sudden you look back and go, wow, I am different. I don't know what I did, but it's just predicated on belief. Our age depends on therapy and self-help. And so when people explore religion, they look for something that wants to solve all their problems. They ask the question, what does religion do to me? Will it help me deal with my grief, my depression, my bankruptcy, my weight problem? They seek a sign from religion and something that promises measurable, tangible benefits. And listen, it does, but that's never the main point. It's never the main point. The main point isn't that God healed me of my diseases. The main point is that Christ forgave me of my sins and has given me his righteousness. This is the main point. I really thought I would do better not screaming because of my voice tonight, but this is, Rachel can tell you, this is something that I'm so radically passionate about and see so many evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic Christians fail time and time again because we just want something to do. We just need something to see. And what I need you to understand is whether you see it or not, he is still real. 
right? If, if God doesn't heal me of my disease, it doesn't mean that he's not there. It means that he is still real and he has a plan and a purpose for that issue. Three liked that. But here's what you have to know. Not only does the world seek a sign, the church seeks a sign. Notice who Jesus is condemning the most. He's condemning the religious Jew. Again, he goes into the Galilee where there are Jewish people worshiping a Jewish God in a Jewish way, and they miss it. And a quick survey of evangelical Christianity makes it difficult not to conclude that Jesus' rebuke is relevant to the church today. We are obsessed with pragmatism. We're seeking after a God who works for us. And if he doesn't work for us, well, it just doesn't work. And what you have to understand, please hear me, I say this with as much humility and as much grace as I can. Just because he's not working the way you want him to does not mean that he is not God. He is God. And we are called to believe in a God whether things are all right or all wrong in our world. And so many times we miss it. You know how I know? Think about 9-11 and how churches filled to the brim. Think about the coronavirus and people got all religious all of a sudden. Why? Because they want God to help them. And I understand that. And that is certainly what we do when we pray. But whether he helps or whether he doesn't does not mean he's not God. Job would say this, though he slay me or though he kill me or though he crush me, I still believe. That's the point of the sign is whether there is good or whether there is bad. We must Believe David Wells, who writes a book, No Place for Truth, explains the American church this way. He says, we have turned to a God that we can use rather than to a God we must obey. We have turned to a God who will fulfill our needs rather than to a God before whom we must surrender our rights. He is a God for us, a God for our satisfaction. Wells argues that evangelicals are like the nobleman in our text, seeking a God they can use and missing the true sign, which is Jesus. So if Jesus asked us not to seek a sign, but to seek him, why did he heal the nobleman's son? Well, the answer is that by in performing the sign, Jesus displayed who he was. He wanted people to get connected to him, not the stuff that he gives. This is easy for you to understand as a parent. We lavish things on our kids, but I don't want my kids to love me because of the stuff I give them. I want them to love me because of who I am. And that's the point. God will lavish you with every... He calls us and tells us to seek him and ask him and knock and have him answer for us. We believe in a God that heals, that resurrects, that feels, that restores. We believe all these things, but don't miss the point. We believe in these things because of who he is. And he is the restorer, the redeemer. He is the forgiver of sins. He is the one we place our trust in. So what shall we do with this? Well, I'm closing with this. Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers, contends that early access, uh, uh, that early access to getting 10,000 hours of deliberate practice allowed the Beatles to become the greatest band in history. Bill Gates to become one of the richest dudes around that Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan because for 10,000 hours, he practiced his craft. 
And I tend to think that this idea should come to believing and understanding Jesus. The more time we spend studying him, understanding him, uh, his word, the more we become experts in him. In other words, our unbelief can be eradicated through our continued understanding and devotion to him. This isn't works. This isn't works. But if you want to get better and have that unbelief crushed in your life, dedicate 10,000 hours. And sadly, the American church dedicates on average one to two hours every four to six weeks to something religious. One to two hours every four to six weeks. So if Gladwell's theory is right, it would take you 555 years to become an expert in the things of God. Do you know why so many people struggle with their unbelief? Because they've not put in the time to understand, contemplate, ponder, reflect upon, and, and just marinate in the truth of God. So my challenge for you tonight is not just to read 36 verses or seven minutes of the Bible every day and mark it off the list. Make a quest in trying to understand God in your life. You're never going to do it. But the more you dive into him, the more you can become sure and sure that what he says is true. Sometimes I walk off the stage and I go, hey, Rachel, how was that? She goes, ah, you could be a little bit more humble. <laughs> and she's right. She's right. Sometimes, like, I make stuff look easy or I just say flippant statements. And I don't mean to do that, but I do my best to try to make this a lifestyle for me. Because I know if it's a lifestyle for me, I can stand with confidence and say, though he slay me, though I get sick, though I might die, I will still serve him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this word. God, I pray that it would sink deep down in our hearts and allow us to have a better understanding, overcome our unbelief. We have so much of it. Overcome our unbelief and give us a passion to look to you as the sign. Look to you first and you promise that everything else will be added to us in your name. Amen. God bless you.